Hello everyone. My name is Abraham Snell and I'm a senior solution architect with the North American public sector of Red Hat. And today we're gonna to talk about renewing your IT culture with automation and more specifically, renewing your IT culture with the Ansible automation platform. So let me share my slides with you and we will get started. Okay. So, again, uh, Abraham Snell, and as I was saying, I, um, we're gonna talk about how the Ansible automation platform is able to renew the culture of your IT organization. So first of all, let me introduce myself. So uh, um, more completely, um, you know my name, Abraham Snell. Um, I've been a Linux engineer and a system administrator. I've been an infrastructure in engineer, an automation engineer. Um, I am currently and have been for several years an adjunct instructor, and I've even been in management in some of the organizations that I've been in. In all, I've been around the industry, I've been in the industry, not around it, I've been in the industry for more than 24 years. As it relates to Ansible, I got started with Ansible when the previous organization that I worked for was looking for a way to fully automate the patch process for the entire enterprise. We've been using CF Engine, um, Puppet via, via Red Hat Satellite, but we needed a more flexible solution. And more importantly, we needed a, a flexible solution that had a small footprint vis-a-vis -vis no um, um, agent. Because as you know, and during, the time, during that time, um, everything had an agent. And so a lot of uh, uh, images resources were being taken up just running the agents. And so we needed something that was uh, agentless and flexible. And that was around 2015. So I have been um, um, engineering solutions with Ansible for about five years. Okay. As IT practitioners, every day, uh, regardless of your role, regardless of your responsibility, there are all kinds of challenges that we face. And, and one of the things we're paid for is to solve you know, those challenges. We spend uh, a lot of effort, which in turn, in, in turn takes a lot of time, which in turn costs a lot of money. And we know those relationships, but effort can also take a human toll. There can be mental, emotional, as well as relational impacts. There can be physical impacts in the form of stress and exhaustion. And those of you that are, you know, that are doing this in operations or carry a pager or whatever, you absolutely know what that's about. So your reasons for automating really should be pretty straightforward. You're tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and over. At the end of the day, automation makes our jobs easier, but it also makes our lives easier. Because when we can automate things, we can reduce that, uh, that amount of effort, that amount of time. It presents us with the opportunity to do more. Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure the managers are like, more work. But yeah, more work, but, but not just more in, in terms of quantity, but more substantive work, more work that actually means something. But also it allows us to finish doing things so we can have some of that work-life balance. Now the Ansible automation platform um, and, and all that it offers empowers IT to be a better partner to business. And, and, and one of the things that's a big buzz, it's more than a buzzword, it's a movement right now, is this thing called digital transformation. And, and so digital transformation is simply this. It's integrating digital technologies into every area of business, fundamentally changing how we operate, but also how we deliver value to customers. And here's the thing about digital transformation. It is not just technology because in that definition, it also states that it's also cultural change that requires organizations to continually challenge the status quo. In other words, so we say this is working just because it's working 
doesn't mean it can't be better. But that also means that they have to learn how to experiment and they have to get comfortable with failure. We call it failing fast. And so when you iterate through a process and you're trying to get to the best you know, point, there are going to be failures along the way. Well, it shouldn't take you a year or two years or worse yet, five years to figure out that a particular process or technology isn't going to work. You should be able to iterate quickly and fail fast. And one of the ways that you can do that is with automation. And so, um, you know, automation and, and, and um, the Ansible automation platform in particular allows for the uniting of teams and eliminating isolated groups. Um, you know, obviously there are management decisions that have to go around uh, eliminating shadow IT. And some people want shadow IT, but as a paradigm, it allows you to unite teams. Uh, of course, it makes doing mundane tasks easier. Uh, and it allows for that collaborative environment. A collaborative environment allows for you to innovate quickly. Many organizations have this problem that I'm about to talk about. And so not picking on anyone, it's just a problem that, that's out there. Um, and, and, and that problem is you have a lot of unintegrated domain specific tools. I mean, you know, every domain, whether it's network or storage or security, uh, even the now we have public and private clouds, there's a tool set that really focuses on that domain. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. Um, uh, in some cases, you, you get to dig deep into that domain. But here's the thing. More and more users are having to use the technology. Yes, traditional IT, ops, dev, security, network, but also lines of businesses are having to be more and more technical. You add on top of that complexity, the use cases that are out there. Now we have, and I'm, I'm an, I've been around a long time, so you know I'm not old, I'm vintage as I say, um, but we have CICD pipelines, we have self-service provisioning now, um, we have artificial intelligence, the internet of things. I mean, it goes on and on the number of use cases out there. So we have now users from multiple um, um, domains and skill sets using the technology. We have growing numbers of use cases. And on top of that, we have all the domains that I mentioned like compute, network, storage, security. Um, and, and if that all wasn't enough, layer across all of that, this idea of governance. How do we govern the interaction between all of these users, use cases, and domains? You get a pretty complex environment. And then when you have unintegrated tools, tools that don't talk to each other, tools that are specific to a particular domain, it makes a complicated situation even worse because everything is talking a different language. So enter a tool like, or the tool, <laughs> uh, um, the Ansible automation platform. And so we know that the Ansible automation platform can, can power just about every part of, of IT and create efficiencies. But it's really more than that. The important question really is, how does automation transform an organization. To illustrate that point, I want to share a story. I call it an infrastructure tale. And if I were to title this infrastructure tale, it would be called Problems Patching Nuclear Plants. That's a lot of P's, but I put that in there for alliteration. Um, here, here's what I want to say up front, though. This is an infrastructure tale because I grew up around the infrastructure organization. I was trained as a developer, but quickly got into uh, infrastructure and really loved it. Um, and so this is through a lens of infrastructure, but the issues, uh, the principle of the issues that I'm gonna share today, really there could be a network uh, operations tail or network security tail or a developer's tail. I mean, these stories, which basically 
uh, boil down to this lack of communication, lack of collaboration, this lack of getting outside the, the siloed walls, this story can be told from a number of different um, lenses. I am telling the story today from the infrastructure lens, but that does not mean that infrastructure is right and everybody else is wrong. It just means that, you know, this problem exists and, um, and it can be solved. And I just want to share something that uh, people in infrastructure and development probably will be familiar with. So let me set up the background for this story. Um, First of all, patching has been mandated by security and the CIO. So it's not a question of whether OS images will be patched. They will be patched. That's the mandate. There's no change in that. Um, and they, they will be patched on a specific schedule, which in the case of Linux Unix was quarterly. Every 90 days, there will be patching done. And that was the edict. This patch process and the schedule was rolled out two years ago. So I'm telling this story, you know, more than two years into um, this process. So it's not brand new. Uh, and in fact, it should be routine. And that, that gives context to the story. Um, one of the things I wanna say that's not on this slide is um, there's a communication process that was rolled out along with the scheduling where the the, the infrastructure support team emails all of the stakeholders, everybody, um, uh, one year out, one month out in every quarter, one week out, and one day out. And so that's a communication process, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Also, I want to point out that this is Q3 of the, of the current year where this story takes place. So the patch outage process has happened already twice, right? It's not even a new process for this year. The other thing to point out is AppDev. AppDev is, uh, is, a, is a team that is customer facing. They directly support the apps uh, and they do some development. They're not the full development team, but they do some development. But they are customer facing in that the lines of business interface directly with them rather than uh, the infrastructure team. And they are feeling a little bit of a pressure from the plant customers regarding uptime. They're feeling skittish because the, the plant customers are saying, you know, our uptime isn't what it should be. The plant customers, this is a line of business, they are feeling pressure because there's an upcoming refueling. And so whenever you're refueling nuclear rods, that can also, that can be a pressure. You know, it can be a little bit of pressure. They've done it, you know, hundreds of times before. There are processes for it, the procedures. But, you know, they always wonder, are the servers going to go down, right? And these servers do pretty important things like testing air quality and that kind of thing. And so there are legitimate plant operations that conflict with outages. And so that, that's, that's just part of business. There, you can't, there's not going to be an always, and most of the time there's, a, there's not a never, right? Just like in personal relationships. And then um, patch automation is ad hoc. It is automated, but you have to press a button to do it, right? So you press the button, the automation starts. The other thing is that automation is only accessible to the infrastructure team. So let's start our story with the classic email exchange. And I say classic because um, as I've told this story, you know, in other settings, people tend to identify with it because, you know, they've, they've been through this, this process. So we start out with the alert. We say, hey, cycle three patching is going to start and we give a date, which if you notice, this was sent out in June. It's a month, more than a month away from patching. So this is to just let everybody know patching will happen. Now, ideally, communication like this should beg a response. And I'm not saying that, you know, the infrastructure support team should not play a part in that, but there should be somebody because you, you're a month out. Somebody should see the email, look at a calendar and go, hey, we need to say this conflicts with, with, with refueling or somebody say something. There's silence, nothing, crickets. So within keeping with the communication process, and by the way, infrastructure isn't asking any questions, but you got to think about it. There are thousands of servers that they are, this is a blast email talk to all the folks that are, that are using those thousands of servers that are out there in the enterprise. 
those those images. So there's a reminder that goes out. Um, this reminder goes out uh, about a week before. Remember, one year, one month before, one week before, one day before. This reminder says passion begins next Saturday. Um, something interesting in this story is to that email, there comes an auto reply. And the auto reply says, we will be out of the office. So now this particular support team is not even in the office the week leading up to the patching or a good portion of that week. Now, here's the thing. This has nothing to do, in, in, the story that I'm telling has nothing to do with whether or not it's okay to be off and all that. I think you should be off uh, because honestly, there's really nothing wrong with being out of the office. Uh, that's your that's that's what automation is about. And as, as you'll see, as we go through this process, you'll see that I really, um, I really push the point home about humanity and, and technology is for the humanity. It's not the other way around. But in this case, we've gone a month and there's been no communication. And now the week before there can be not a lot of communication because that team is out of the office. Awesome. <laughs> so this is this next set of uh, exchanges is what I call the day before shenanigans. The day before, I call it the day before shenanigans because honestly it happens uh, like clockwork every quarter, right? It may not be this particular organization, but there's always this whole scheduling um, we can't do it now. Can you do it then? And, and, you know, this back and forth that typically doesn't take place until the day or two days before. It doesn't take place throughout that whole month when, when this negotiation part could have gone on. And honestly, maybe that's not even the best way anyway. And, and you'll understand that when I share, you know, more of the solution. So we send out the reminder and the reminder says there'll be passion tomorrow, service will be down approximately 30 minutes, you know, all the normal stuff. Here's the shady part. And this is cultural. This is where we start talking about how culture starts to taint. Culture starts to, um, to become negative when it doesn't need to be, which starts to slow things down and makes the entire IT organization not better worse because it becomes slower, it becomes more rigid and less flexible, it becomes more um, silo oriented, not less silo oriented with shady responses like this. So the plant tech team are, are people that actually work at the plant in the remote location and they interface a lot with the app team and, and, the, and the infrastructure support team. But in this case, they get the reminder and then they say, has there been any communication with the plant folks on this outage? Now, if we go back through these emails, obviously we could do that and we could all be on the, infra if you're on the infrastructure team, you can be justified and you can make your argument and say, we communicated with everybody. You guys are just, you know, just not reading your emails. And that is one response, but that is really not the response that we want to give. Although I must confess that this response is shady. And especially when you only send it to the app team. Um, well, of course, the app team is already feeling pressure for uh, uh, regarding uptime of, of the particular applications and there's a refueling. And so the meltdown happens. And so the reply email to everybody, they just blast it to everybody and their brother. And they say, none of this work has been coordinated, which is not completely accurate. And this will not happen tomorrow. The plant servers won't be touched. And so this well laid out plan, people you know, on the infrastructure team have scheduled it and some people have planned that they will be available. And so their life has kind of been changed and disrupted. And I, let me just give you a picture of the feeling. And that feeling now starts to reinforce their feelings that the, you know, the, the app team is crazy and the techs are shady and you know nobody really cares about us and you know the whole line of of, of reasoning that really taints culture. And, and by the way, as I was saying before. In this case, we're looking through the lens of infrastructure, but a dev team can say, man, those infrastructure guys never spin up 
the cap the the resources we need and if they do it's never in time we're always waiting on infrastructure they can have the same the security guys can say man these people are so insecure they won't even implement the the things and these things are there to protect them i mean so everybody has a lens and everybody has these cultural stories and it just makes the silo walls bigger it just it just makes them taller right and the question is how do we solve this riddle? I mean, how do, I mean, because listen, I've been in IT nearly 25 years and the extent of my time in IT, and I've been in multiple organizations, there is some of this all around. And so maybe you don't completely eliminate it, but there are ways to change this culture. Because when you take a step back, both the infrastructure support team and the app dev team are concerned about the same thing. That just never shows itself in the communication, but they are concerned about the same thing. So here at Red Hat, when we talk about digital transformation, we include more than just the technology. And I said that you know earlier on that it's not just technology, it is these three components. It's, it's culture. In fact, culture, uh, in, a, in a recent survey has been shown that it is the biggest thing that hinders digital transformation. And that's why that definition of digital transformation includes changing the culture. I'm gonna call the culture humanity and I'm doing that so in your mind, you can understand that we are talking about people. We're not just talking about abstract things here. It, you need to understand that this is a, these are humans. And, and humans are not technology. They're, they're not zeros and ones. Uh, they're not that predictable, but they are the linchpin. They are the key to any kind of success um, that you're gonna have. In fact, uh, I have a formula and we'll look at that in a little bit, but success equals these three things, culture, process, technology, which I'm, and I'm calling culture, humanity. So here's the formula, success equals humanity plus process plus technology. And we're gonna reflect on humanity just a little bit for a while. Real career success is enhanced and in some cases it's really based on how we balance our technical skills with our people skill, skills. I mean, we've often heard the analogy of the guy who just goes into a cubicle, head down with his keyboard, doesn't interact with any people. And, 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 and some of that is still around and can be used, but we are also in a different time when you really need people skills um, in order to work at the speed of business. And there are a lot of people skills that we can choose from, but here are a few concepts that I just wanna talk about um, that I think will help as we, um, as we, as we go through the solution for this. So first of all, it's empathy, basically putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So if that infrastructure support guy could just say, what is it like to be on the dev team and receiving that pressure of not being up? And then here, now I hear that we're about to take some downtime. You know, just putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And then, and doing that, having some compassion. And compassion is simply feeling the pain of others and then being motivated to relieve that pain. So you, you see, okay, they might feel like this. How can I help? What, what can I do to make that different? While I get the needs of infrastructure met, we meet the needs of the company, but also I help this poor guy who is staring in the face of a customer saying why their servers are gonna be down during a refueling. The other thing, another uh, aspect of, of humanity um, or, or or really a skill set is, is on this understanding of community. And it's simply, a community is simply connected environments. Um, just because we are in management or, or you know, org chart silos does not mean we're not connected to the dev team, does not mean we're not connected to the plant tent, really does not mean we're not connected to the lines of business. Because with these connected environments, there are connected outcomes. So just because, you know, the, the, the customer is looking at app dev and talking about uptime. They are really not thinking app dev, they're thinking IT. They're thinking, why can't IT keep my servers up? So th that connected environment 
results in a connected outcome. And here's the thing, you can never be better than your community, but you can make your community better. So companies and their clients are communities and we're part of those communities and we have to see ourselves as connected. So that's just, you know, a skill, you know, a way of thinking that we probably should adopt. Um, the, the next thing is leadership, plain and simple, it's influence. Uh, but it also includes initiative, which is the ability to assess and act without being ordered to do so or being forced to do so by circumstances. And so we have influence, some more than others, but we all have influence. We can use that influence to be the guy complaining and saying, man, those out there folks, they are not good at what they do, so forth and so on. Or we can use that same influence and say, hey guys, how do we help out Dev and ourselves not go through this back and forth every single quarter? So that's taking some of these people portions of this and applying it to what we do every day. The next one is process. This is employing the use of modern tech paradigms um, so that we create these uh, human friendly type solutions, right? These paradigms together also serve the purpose of giving the end user more ability to choose their where and when, which is actually how we fix the problem, right? How we address the problem. We address the problem with automation. We were already automating, remember, in an ad hoc fashion where we were pressing a button and, and patching all the servers. But we only, we were, infrastructure were the only people that had access to that. But then, so we, the, the thought was, how do we extend this access? Because it's already automated. We figured that out for us. But now we can share this outside of us, right? And give the DevOps team the ability to press the button so they can choose their when or where, and we're not doing a back and forth over scheduling, right? Um, some of the process paradigms that you can think about that, that you can employ are things like Agile, which by the way, Agile is not really a methodology. It's more of a set of values. It's a, it's a paradigm. Um, and, and I want to read some of the values. There are four values of Agile. Um, one is focus should be more on individuals and interactions instead of processes and tools. I, I think that's groundbreaking to be something that's actually in IT. So Agile is not just having a stand-up meeting, you know, really quickly. I mean, but the reason for the stand-up meeting goes back to these principles. For, for instance, um, another one of the four values is the process should respond to change rather than follow a plan. So sometimes we have this well laid out plan like infrastructure had spent and, and, and I, when I say infrastructure, I mean me, because I primarily wrote that plan and wrote the automation. I spent so much time laying out everything and negotiating with everybody and figuring out how we would do this thing across the enterprise. And then it was back to the same kind of you know, back and forth um, about scheduling or back and forth about certain things. And uh, yeah, you want to smooth those things out and work those things out. But what should should have been a little bit more uh, uh, on my mind then, you know, came later, uh, is that how do I make this process respond to the change, the inevitable change that's in every one of your environments? And then there's DevOps, which is moving code from, from the birth to all the way to retirement, really. Uh, and then there's abstraction, giving people a black box, right? But the black box is helpful and they can use it whenever they want to, however they want to, to get that particular outcome. But they don't have to know all the permissions and all the connections. They just know they can press the button. And then finally, the technology. And in this case, we're talking about Red Hat Ansible automation platform. And so the platform, and there are other sessions that you'll be able to attend where you can go uh, a much deeper dive into the platform. Um, but it's basically the engine, and then which allows you to create the playbooks, create the logic. And then it's the it's Ansible Tower, which allows you to take that logic and distribute it and control it uh, basically with access controls at scale. So you can do it across the enterprise and allow people to run automations that they didn't write 
or write automations and share them with other people to use. And then there's the third layer, which is uh, the hosted layer where you can pull in, you know, other code and reuse that code um, for your, you know, change it and use it for your benefit, as well as it's an intelligence piece to it where you can see, you know, what kinds of automations are running, how many of what kinds of automations are run. So you can take that data and determine, you know, what are the things that need to be done that are being done that need, you know, that need more resources, you know, all of those things. At the end of the day, you can start out with just the create piece um, and then grow as you, as you gain uh, you know, competence and this other thing as adoption happens. And so the, uh, the automation adoption journey is a tailored journey. It's not gonna be the same for every person. It's based on you know, your efforts in deploying and managing you know, a portfolio of automation. And, and workflows, but it's also you driving cultural change across the business. So you're sharing these automations, but in doing so, there's a collaborative piece where you're talking to the DBAs and saying, hey, I have this part of it, but you know, you guys do this more than I, and how could Ansible help you? And hey, by the way, log on the tower and or log in to, you know, you have Ansible already, log on the tower and see how you can, you know, make your space better and even make our space better. Or where do we collaborate? Say we say we collaborate with the database folks on, you know, building out images that run a that 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 set an environment for a particular database and we automate all of that. And now they just press a button, pop up their environment, it loads their database on it. Bada bing, bada boom, they're good to go. But in order to get to that point, you need to do that kind of collaboration. So I told you what we did to solve the problem was give the app dev team the ability to press a button and launch their automation. And that button is the easy button, right? Of course, it's the easy button. So this presentation is about some, you know, definitely about some finite um, not finite. It's definitely about some people centric stuff and the way we think about it. But I also want to share some code with you. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but I'm going to share with you the patch code that we used um, that's behind this easy button. And so we start with the main playbook. And in this main playbook, we do a snapshot. Most of these images that are out there were VM images. There were thousands of VM images, but we didn't snapshot all of them. We snapshotted only a few when customers came to us because snapshotting thousands of images would bog down the, excuse me, the VMware farm to a, a virtual halt. And so that's not something that operationally we wanted to do. And then the next thing is just import these different roles that do task, you know, before patching, the patching task, doing a reboot, and then a post task. Um, and then the pre-patch role, basically, you don't have to have all this stuff. You don't even have to have a pre-patch role. It just depends on your environment. Oh, and by the way, this code is old. I'm going to replace this with some up-to-date code. And I put some up-to-date code out on my GitHub. Um, but I'm going to replace this with, with more up-to-date code. But this is the classic code that, that we were using back when there was a such thing as Rail 5. Um, so basically, we just wanted to capture the uptime before. We're going to capture it, uh, the after uptime so we can compare it in a report. We disable uh, third-party repositories because we we're not here to update the developer stuff or ePL or all of that stuff. We want to update the system stuff because that was our charge. Clearing the cache is just kind of the thing we do. And then, you know, RHEL 5 had some 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 special things that we needed to do for it because it was an ELS. So we had to enable ELS repositories, so forth and so on. And so we did that in a different task. And so that's what's going on in the pre-patch. Now we're in the patch role where we're actually patching. And that first block of code, you, you really, this block of code was only there because um, of some Python uh, um, uh, um, um, dependencies that we couldn't do, we couldn't backport into rail five. So we just ran the yum command rather than using the yum module. And, uh, and then here we, we patch everything else with the yum module. Um, and then we set some facts. We're basically saying, Hey, 
yeah, if we um, if we if we patch the system, then we do need to reboot. And we also want to capture the fact that we actually patched it. If this fails, then it sets it to no, we don't need to reboot and we don't need to patch it. So we don't take unnecessary downtime. And then we go to the reboot role where it does what you think it reboots. We do set a timeout because we were patching both virtual machines and um, physical servers and physical servers take longer. So we basically set a timeout based on if that virtualization role is set to host or, or VM. Um, we reboot the box, which is pretty straightforward. And then we just capture some, some stuff um, to, to output to the screen just to show how long it took and if it actually rebooted. And then in the post patch role here, we re-enable those third-party repos that we disabled. Um, and then we, you know, capture some more information that we're going to use comparatively in the report. And I'll, I will get to the report in a moment. Um, and then we, um, we update uh, some custom facts on the server that tell it, hey, this guy was patched and some other things. And then we create a report. And I just created a report using Ginger 2 because reporting in Ansible back then really was, was just not good. You could, so you had to be creative and create your own reports. And I, I did that in Ginger 2. In fact, here is the report template right here. This is a Ginger 2 file. This is just a, just a template file that we're gonna drop some things in. Uh, we actually do some logic here to determine which boot message to print out. If the system actually booted, um, and, or if it didn't boot, we print out we print out one message. If it boots, we print out another message. If it did not boot, and so here's an actual report that was generated via that file. So you can see that the minor number did not change on this upgrade, but the kernel did change a few revs, uh, and uh, it took 53 seconds. This is a virtual machine, which is awesome for everybody included. And here is the actual easy button within Tower. So in Tower, you give that app, the app dev team just the permissions they need to press this button. Or if they have automations, obviously you can give them more permissions or, or whatever. But if everything comes up green as it did most of the time, they're good to go. Log into their uh, app and um, I mean, log into the server or, or their app, whatever, check it out, make sure things are good to go. If it's red, you just give the support team a call. We're on it to check it out and we're good to go. The important thing about this easy button is within that 90 day window, they can do this at their leisure. As long as that, obviously they put in the, the change uh, information that they need to with the change team and all of that stuff. As long as they take care of all their paperwork, they can patch their own system. And guess what we've eliminated? We've eliminated this back and forth, this need for shady emails, this need for even a silo. And by the way, we get to now collaborate with them because they might want customizations or they might want to know how they can use this kind of automation to help things in their area. So now we become a more trusting, you know, IT organization. And this is just one way that automation can help to change your IT's culture. So in summary, the Ansible automation platform, if used, because um, it, it, it's an enterprise product, it can be used across the enterprise. Ansible can automate almost anything. There's so many things that Ansible can automate. And so if used properly, it can help to renew your IT culture. It can help it to become that more collaborative uh, culture, DevOps, if you will. And this, you know, just remember that success equals humanity or, or culture, but it's people, process, and technology. It's not just technology. So go out and create an easy button for someone because that's what we as technologists do. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and so that's the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully you will be in touch. Again, my name is Abraham Snell and my email address is asnell, that's A-S-N-E-L-L -L, at redhat.com. Have a wonderful rest of your day.